one. Life-size dolls that can do anything at all. Sid and Marty Kraft. <laughs> it couldn't be them. Sid and Marty have gone straight after their last caper. Them, not dummies. <laughs> as night watchman here at Fred's Wax Museum to put myself through criminology college. It used to be very lonely until recently when I plugged in my crime computer. Suddenly, oscillating vibrations brought to life three legendary monsters. Dracula. The werewolf. And Frankenstein. Creatures hated and feared for centuries now determined to make up for their past misbehaving by fighting crime wherever they find it. Together, we're the Monster Squad. Welcome back, citizens, to an all-new episode of the Bat Cave Podcast. It's your old bat chum, John S. Drew here, and guess what? Finally settling down and watching some more episodes of Monster Squad, and I can't do that unless I invite back into the Batcave our old friend from Revolution SF, from the Dragon Con American Sci-Fi Classics track, the co-moderator himself, Mr. Joe Crow. Hey, Joe. Hey, how are you? I am. I'm, I'm, I'm sliding down the bat pole. Everything is <laughs> working out. So everything's working out. Yep. And we've got two episodes that we're actually sitting down just to pull back the curtain here a little bit. We're going to do this in a block here of two episodes. I'm trying to get more content. So this way we're good to go in the coming weeks when the fall comes and, and hits us, depending on how all this is all going to work out with our uh, current world situation in 2020 as we record this. <laughs> Uh, hitting us is probably a very accurate verb. Yes. Yep. And and even though you sit there and, you, you know, it's like when you were kids and maybe you challenged each other to smack the other one really hard and you brace yourselves, it still hurt no matter how much you braced yourself. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. 2020. <laughs> that is 100% <laughs> what's happening right now. But I will tell you, though, that at least we've got some good episodes here to talk about. Our first one that we've got today for this particular episode, we're dealing with the villain of Mr. Mephisto, which already in itself, I love the name. Yeah, I was looking for hints that this guy was the actual Christian devil. Yes. There are some. (laughs) See, I totally missed it. I to- I just thought, okay, he's taking this creepy name for some reason. And that's something, too, I've noticed, is that there are certain elements in this show for the adults. Oh, yeah. Which I didn't get with our first one with Queen Bee, but I'm seeing it with this one and the next episode. There are things there that the adults can look and go, oh, I get that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. There, there's mm, – this episode – has a lot. It does. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, this episode aired September 18th, 1976, written by Alan Diehart, Herbert Finn, were the writers, the director, Wes Kenny, who will also direct the next episode we're going to talk about. The main character, Mr. F- Mephisto, played by Barry Denon, who, for Batman fans, and I didn't realize this, this was like one of his first roles. He was on Batman playing Fred in the third season shame episode. We're going to do something which I like to refer to as uh, the great train robbery. That's scarcely original, you know. A big mouth is better when it's shut, Fred. So keep your tongue harnessed and you'll have a thin lip. I stand chastised. Good. That is one of my favorite episodes. (laughs) It is. It and is. I did not know that yeah. until, uh, well, until you you just told me. So, uh, well, yeah, that's that, there's a lot of similarities to a Batman episode in this one. Oh, definitely a lot of similarities. But the thing is, you wouldn't have known it because, honestly, I wouldn't have known it if I hadn't done the IMDb check. He doesn't look a thing, even though he's wearing a mustache. He doesn't look a thing like Fred in the Batman episode because Fred was this Mexican that they brought in to help with the robbery. And, of course, 
there's some, you know, now would be considered probably a little off humor there and such about how I can't understand a word Fred's saying. He's not speaking, though, with a Mexican accent in the episode. He's speaking almost with a British droll. I don't know about <laughs> I don't know about Fred, but I'm glad that he got promoted to a main villain. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> what, what I want to think of in my in my head canon is the Mexican thing clearly didn't work out back in 67, 68. And so he took off the fake mustache and said, now I'm going to be the devil. Yeah. <laughs> It's funny, too, because his whole method of operations kind of has, I guess that's maybe, I don't know, and you can explain it as we go along here, because like I say, I missed it, but I guess I'm thinking, you know, the whole idea of seducing through hypnotism and such, I don't know, you know, because because that seems to be, and it's not even his power, it's the power of his two dolls, Baby Doll and Arlene Doll, played by mm-hmm. Kathy Worthington and Mindy Miller, but... But, uh, yeah, I, I I just liked it for, you know, because he really wasn't even the strongest character out, out of, you know, I think even Queen Bee had a little bit more going for her in that regard. But I did like it because we have him. We also have two recurring characters who are actually going to be back uh, in separate episodes, or I think the same episode. Uh, Edward Andrews playing Mayor Goldwyn and Paul Smith playing Officer McMacMac. <laughs> I'm so glad they come back, but the <laughs> the mayor is a treat in yes. this episode. He, uh, of course, you've you've seen him in a million things. As soon as he came on screen, I was like, oh, that guy. But yep. yeah, he he's been in tons of stuff, and he's really good in this too. He is really good in this too. I didn't realize because, like, I know him from sixties, seventies television, mostly comedies and such. But towards the end of his career, he was in Sixteen Candles and Gremlins. Yeah, I saw that too. And I, and I, again, when you think of him, you go, "Oh yeah, he was in Sixteen Candles and Gremlins." Yeah. No, he's in he's in tons of things. Mm. And and our officer McMacMac, played by Paul Smith was also in Batman 66, playing Artemis Kanab, the millionaire uh, monopolist, uh, who was in the Puzzler episode with Maurice Evans. I don't care what happens to the market. I'll give you 5200 for Park Place and not a penny more. 6000 I feel like, uh, again, I want to connect this to Batman, so I'm going to say maybe he lost all his money in a, uh, sh- a shameful scheme or a shameful scam, perhaps, and then had to take a job on the right side of the law <laughs> as Officer Matt Mack. I will, I, I will say that I'm going to take this totally in that the fact that our main character, Walter, in this show takes his cues from Batman altogether because there's like – Moments where he talks about being law-abiding citizens and gives examples of what a good law-abiding citizen does throughout this and the next episode that sort of makes me think he probably loved Batman so much and took his love for monsters and then combined the two by creating this crime-fighting force. (laughs) Clearly. Um, Well, let's get into the episode itself here. It opens with a ceremony at the museum, the unveiling of a statue of Richard Knightley, the former mayor of Metro City, and Mayor Goldwyn's going to give a speech. He drops his note cards, and he's approached by these two women who are very mod-looking with their uh, outfits there, our dolls. They hypnotize him. By, and I thought this was funny. I like that with the way they just sort of like grab their eyes and kind of clockwork orange them to stare at him to get him to come with them. <laughs> I did not make that connection. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what they did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and of course, you know, just like in true Batman humor when they lure him away they say walk this way and they've got a little swagger to them so he starts swaggering as he walks off Uh, (laughs) solid gold yeah yeah (laughs) he'll step out a moment later and then proceeds to give his speech now it is time to unveil the statue of our former mayor now there stands 
hands the replica of a crook. A blackguard and a scoundrel, a man who had his hand in everybody's pocket. Look at those shifty little eyes. Look at that cruel mouth. There stands a man whose name was a household word. Think. Thank you, fellow citizens. Not cool, man. No. But I, I guess the, the deal with Mephisto is he's going to shake up the political system mm -hmm. <laughs> somehow. But, but the guy's already... The previous mayor, who cares? The guy's not the mayor anymore. Why right. is he going after that guy so hard? Well, the, the whole beginning was a little confusing for me in general, because at first I wondered, did he have the mayor always under his control? Because then we're introduced to the doll version of the mayor, and I didn't make the connection until later on that it was like, oh no, they did the switcheroo in there, and the whole point of the doll scene was expository just to sort of explain to us and show us this is how it all works. Right, right. A lot of intricate plotting on the part of Mephisto. Yes, yes. And all to, of course, get money. Because he, he basically then has his doll mayor, which has now taken the place of the real mayor, go out and raise taxes by a thousand percent. That's bad math all the way around. That's not good. <laughs> and, but, but, you know, in thinking about it, inflation was what still is today. But uh, in the 70s, I recall that being the, a big political thing. So here we are making political statements on the Monster Squad. Making political statements and making them in a way that is impossible for the little man to deal with, just like today, because they've only got 24 hours to pay off their debt or <laughs> their else. enormous debt. Yes. And that includes the Wax Museum, as Officer McMacMac arrives with the news of the tax increase. Oh, Larry Buck, it's strange out there. Now, I have here a copy of last year's tax bill. Oh, yeah? And you'll notice that this year's bill is much larger. <laughs> the tax has been raised to $5,000. So ain't that a kick in the head? Mm, poor Mrs. Teller will never be able to pay that. Who ordered this? The mayor, would you believe it? He seems to have changed overnight. Yeah, but he's not the only one. How about our chief of police? Hmm? This morning he gave his very own wife a speeding ticket. Well, if she was speeding, she was walking. <laughs> Officer McMacMac, I have a theory about these strange goings on. Yeah? Yes. Apparently, our public officials are under the influence of some strange and malevolent force. Yeah, you, you, you took the words right out of my mouth. However, they are our duly elected officials, and the law must be obeyed. When you're right, you're right. Uh, p p poor Mrs. Tallow. You know, she might have to close down the museum, and I'll be out of a job. Oh, yeah, but you won't be the only one. Ah, <laughs> I mean, all these places around here have to close. I mean, the businesses all go bankrupt. The people are going to lose their homes and automobiles. Uh, everybody will be on relief. Well, uh, have a good day. <laughs> Gopher's like, well, crap, now what? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was interesting, too, though, especially in light of the way this episode ends. When Officer McMacMac shows, the monsters go and hide. Yeah, I mean, they're wax figures right why do they have to <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly they could have just gotten back into place and such but at the end of the episode the mayor is now aware of the monster squad so does that legitimize them do they become duly deputized agents we never we i don't think we ever find out anything like that and obviously he's going to come back so is he going to remember the squad well, now I'm anxious to find out because <laughs> I did not recall that he comes back. So th this show, the, this, the, this whole show overall, and I think we addressed this when we did episode one, but there's a lot going on here. <laughs> yeah. The, Dracula is Angel before Angel. Yeah. <laughs> he is. <laughs> and he... Uh, Somehow he's he's trying to make up for hundreds of years of evil doing. Yes. <laughs> oh gosh. Um, 
we find out too, and this is another little bit that I guess because so much is going on, they don't really play it up much because Officer McMacMac po- points out that not only is the mayor acting oddly, but the chief of police. Yeah. Um, do we do we see the chief of police or no. is Officer McMac? Okay, yeah, he just makes a point. To, right. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, Mephisto's skull duggery is being uncovered. It's, it's he's infesting the political system in in Metro City. The political, the law enforcement. I mean, you know, in some ways, you almost wish this was like a two parter or something because there's a lot more plot to it. But we got to wrap this all up in twenty twenty two minutes. They went for it in now. Well. I would say they maybe maybe didn't go for it as much as they do in the first episode and the third, but in this one, there's added threat of foreclosure on, <laughs> and the closing of the wax museum isn't really addressed uh, because again, they, like you said, there's only twenty minutes, but right. they that th- that seems like a, an extra threat that. A show like this, you know, just a wacky Saturday morning show would not have gotten so far into, but they did. Right. Exactly. That's the thing. This really comes across when you consider some of the other live action shows, it never got, I mean, and God love them as much as I love Shazam and Isis, it never got even that in depth as, you know, some of the episodes I'm seeing on the, on this show, even though it's all done for humor. The wax museum is owned by somebody, but they have to shut it down because of the tax burden uh, unethically applied by the doll version of the mayor. And we're not even five minutes into the episode. (laughs) (laughs) Unethically applied, and yet, and this is very Batman 66, and he says it with the same earnestness that Adam West would say, there's Walter going, but it is the law, and we must obey the law no matter what. Walter's a stickler. Yes. <laughs> Even though he is working with historically <laughs> evil monsters. Right. <laughs> Even though, exactly. And there's a whole ethics question right there, too. But <laughs> I mean, Dracula. Now, granted... Frankenstein is well. Frank N. Stein is a a well. I think he's the Frankenstein monster. I think we established that. Bruce Wolf, he's just a werewolf. Yeah, we don't know what he's gotten up to, but Dracula <laughs> is Dracula. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I love the next part because they work out like they're they're basically trying to feed the computer clues so that the computer can help them figure out what's going on here. And each of them contributes something. Now, it all started when those girls took the mayor behind the curtain. I noticed something weird about those girls, a distinct aroma of lubricating oil. Good news. Put that in the computer. Computer? Lubricating oil. Hey, squad. This might be a clue. One of the girls were drinking out of this glass. And look, no fingerprints. No fingerprints. I also noticed something very strange. The distinct absence of a jugular vein. Are you sure they had no jugular vein? Of course I'm sure. That's the first thing I look for on the woman. No jugular vein. Hmm? Uh, Pardon me, computer. Juggler vein. There's something else. When the mayor and those girls came out from behind the curtain, I noticed their eyes were blinking at the exact same rate. 18.6 times per minute. That could mean something. All right, let's see what the computer tells us. What does it say, Walt? Behind every man, there's a doll. (laughs) Dumb machine. Ask for more information. Right. More information. Let your fingers do the walking, and don't call me dumb. Let your fingers do the walking. Aha! 
dolls. Uh, look under life-size dolls. Here's one. Life-size dolls that can do anything at all. Sid and Marty Kraft. <laughs> it couldn't be them. Sid and Marty have gone straight after their last caper. Them, no dummies. Here's another one. Mephisto's Dollhouse and Sausage Factory, 382638 Broad Street. That's more like it. All right, you men know what to do. Sure. Wow. Get over there right away. Let's go, squad. And the computer corrects his pronunciation of jugular. Yes. <laughs> that owned me. <laughs> I just, it's just out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. And then him just say, uh, to, uh, Walter going, computer, lubricant. <laughs> just, the I, I also like the fact that, you know, because they go, oh, the you know dumb computer and stuff. And it, comes, it shoots back and says, don't call me dumb. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's dangerous business. No, don't mess with computers, even in the 70s. Yes. Especially in the 70s. I, I thought it funny because then they go, once they, they figure out that it's something to do with life-size dolls, because the they realize that the two girls are not real women. They're just, they're dolls, animated dolls. So they look up life-size dolls, and we get a dig in at Sid and Marty Crafts life-size <laughs> dolls. Yeah! <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. Because my, my first thought was, oh, well, I, this is a Saturday morning. I, my, I just the first thought that popped into my head was, well, of course, this is a Croft production. And then I mm-hmm. realized, uh, no, it's not. Yeah, yeah, no, that's the thing. You would think for a moment that you can't, you forget because there's basically it was Sid and Marty Croft and Filmation. They had the live action end of the market on Saturday mornings in the seventies. And but no, no, here's this show that just comes out of nowhere, and it's neither company producing it. So the squad moves out to investigate. They get to the location. And this was something I noticed, too, uh, in watching these two episodes, is that they can only go out, the monsters, at night. They come to life at night. During the day, they're on display, which means, you know, all your activities, all your, your things you have to do is at night. But yet, the characters themselves are never seen outdoors at night, other than the stock footage of the van driving through the streets. Otherwise... It's all in studio, even like, say, when they approach the factory, it's an exterior, but it's all in studio, and it's just everything's darkened. Maybe they um, didn't want to terrify 1970s Burbank (laughs) (laughs) citizens. Um, um, I'm I'm assuming it it was taped in California. I mean, it's everything. Uh, But... (laughs) The wire Dracula and a Wolfman and a Frankenstein walking around at night here in our city. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, there's it's it's all just it's all just sets and somehow the sets all look different. And yes. I mean, they they really go for it set wise. Uh, although it, it is all sets, they they go for it and the. I guess I just noticed it this time because they interact with the set more so mm-hmm. than I remember. The Wax Museum set is enormous. Yep. Like Batcave enormous. Yep. Like when when like the giant swooping staircase when Officer Mac Mac and Walter have to go up and down it, I wow, there's a lot it's it's huge. Yep. Uh, Yep, and every time we get a, a villain's lair so far in these first three episodes we've watched, the layers are all detailed. More so, more so than a third season Batman set. Indeed, yeah. All the little details in the in Mephisto's set are bizarre, and the Monster Squad is the, there's stuff going on in this in, in like. When Frankenstein walks past the weirdly inflated woman doll and <laughs> starts stroking her hand, <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> 
that's that's the stuff for the adults, I guess. <laughs> and, and and the the measurements uh, earlier uh, with uh, with the with Bruce Wolf, same thing. But wow, yeah, how did that get in there? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's and and then at the same time, there's there's the cute references like you know because Frank and Drac go into the store while Wolfie's supposed to make his way around to the back there, um, and Mephisto's even looking at Frank, going, "Where do I know you from?" And Dracula points out, "Oh, you may have seen him on Let's Make a Deal," which is a really cute reference <laughs> because people dressed up in weird stuff on Let's Make a Deal. Exactly. Yep. Yep. But the girls come out, they hypnotize the two, tie them down to a conveyor belt where they're going to make them. That's that's where we get the sausage parts of this whole factory here. <laughs> uh. <laughs> and yeah, and this this reminds me it, it's not as big. It reminded me of the um, perforating. Oh gosh, the perforating and stamp making machine from the uh, Batman and Green Hornet episode yes. of uh, Batman. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's not quite as big though. If no. You don't actually see them going into the machine. They we don't get to that part. No, because we'll, uh, Bruce comes in, you know, at at basically the last moment to save them there. I, I got a kick out of it, though, because at first he's watching them and he thinks because he sees them from the window and he's like, oh, look at them sleeping on the job until he comes to realize what's going on. <laughs> oh, and he does a bat climb. Yes. Yes, that he does. Was, that was neat. It's It wasn't the most impressive of bat climbs. And I was expecting I was ho- once I saw him do it, I thought, well, surely somebody's going to pop out of the window. They're going to do a thing. And they didn't. But that's OK. Still, I like the reference. Yep. Yep. And and Bruce, before he jumps in, I liked also he's trying to get a hold of Walter, but Walter's too busy with Officer McMacmac, who has orders to shut the museum down because they didn't pay the taxes on time. And then he's got to go and deal with the orphanage. And they never go back to that statement. No. And, and the whole thing about the kids being homeless, that's the punchline. That's yeah. like, go like, ha ha, those kids are homeless now. And they never <laughs> go back and resolve the fact that they had to shut down the orphanage. Yeah. <laughs> See, this is where I'm saying all these little things would have been great for two for a two parter. My assumption, of course, would be that the evil doing is reversed at the end, but we don't hear about it. Come on. <laughs> well, well, one would assume because at the end, the museum's open. So. OK. So One would assume they round up the 1970s urchin children and put them back <laughs> in the <laughs> orphanage. We hope. Yeah, that, that's a good question. If you're going to shut down an orphanage, where do the kids go in the time for the time being? Because <laughs> you've just taken them from their home, and what other home do you have for them? <laughs> I mean, do you just put them out in the junkyard, like in Fat Albert and the and the Cosby Kids? Yeah, <laughs> let them wait it out. <laughs> wow. And I'm laughing at this. This is sad. <laughs> this is this is where 2020 has gotten me. So, well, oh. yeah, exactly. But in the 70s, you know, you could hitchhike. It was fine. It was fine. You could hitchhike. You could get a ride from your teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure orphanages were just were, were you just you know you come and go as you please. It's no right, way. right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so Bruce jumps in. And I, I, I thought this was interesting. They managed to capture both, uh, you know, Frank and, and Dracula there, but Bruce is able to scare them off with his growls and, and holding them off while he, while he gets the two of them, you know, off the, the, the belt. <laughs> That's my favorite. This is a tour de force for Bruce, this, this episode. Yes. Because <laughs> he busts through the window with his crazy werewolf strength and then instills mortal terror in the villains. That's great. <laughs> That's a, he's, he's all about it in this episode. And what's funny is, is that we get the equivalent of a bat fight of sorts because the dolls have, you know, the, these, these blow up weapons that they're <laughs> able to sort of, 
keep at bay our monsters. And of course, Frank reminding everyone you can't hit a woman, even if she is a doll. Yeah. Yes, they put that in there. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I appreciated the craziness of this bat fight. There's no punching. Nope. And yet somehow, although and they make it obvious, they they even bend the inflatable bats. But they they say, hey, look, we're fighting, but it's harmless fighting. Well, hang on a second, because here's the thing: it's not the, I, and because I, I just I. I lost my place on my notes for a moment there. This episode is not with the inflatable bats. This is the episode with the inflatable punching clowns. I stand corrected. That is a later thing. The, uh, yes, the, the clowns. <laughs> Maybe I just tried to wrap that away from my memory. <laughs> yes, the clowns. Oh my gosh, the clowns. Yeah. The villains HQ in this one has a plethora of disturbing imagery. Yes. Yes, it does. It does. And I did like how they are able to sort of disarm the dolls by Drac going and biting into and deflating each of the punching bags. (laughs) So he used his powers too. Yes. Yep. So good. Mephisto surrenders. They take pillowcases, wherever those came from, and use them to put over the dolls' heads so that they cannot hypnotize them. Uh, and that's when our doll mayor arrives with more money that he's collected from the taxes. With, uh, and, and the bag with the dollar sign on it. Yes. Classic. <laughs> that's how I, I really... Of course, at the time, I thought, oh, oh, this is how you handle money. And now I wish it was how you handle money. Well, yes and no, but considering our our world, you know, people would then automatically know you're handling money and come at you. That is true. That is true. But I would love to get paid in a bag bag of with money in it. With money in it, that'd be great. <laughs> just just get in line, get your weekly pay. Here it is. No checks. No any, just a bag Here's of money, and then bag. you deal with it, and then you deal with it as you see. Yeah, friend. it's uh, it's on you. If somebody takes your bag of money, that's that's your <laughs> fault, buddy. <laughs> Uh, and I love this because now we get the whole thing. That's the doll. He's had the mayor. And I guess like some of these, uh, you know, like invasion of the body snatchers or what have you, we still need to keep the original just in case. But he's got the mayor still under the trance of the dolls. So he's yeah. got to break him out with <laughs> his uh, his incantation or whatever you want to call it. Okay, Mephisto, break that spell or I'll sip the wolfman on you. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Ibbity bibbity bobbity boo. When I snap my fingers, out of the spell comes Y O U. Where am I? What happened? I, where did all this money come from? Honestly, I don't know anything about that money. I never saw that money before in my life. Honest, I am not a crook. Honest. We know you're innocent, Mayor Goldwyn. These ruthless criminals are responsible for bilking our good citizens out of their hard earned money. But it's all over for them now. You have my heartfelt thanks, all of you. Because now we get to the end, and the mayor is given a proclamation thanking the the squad. You know, Walter's got it there at the at the museum as they're getting ready to shut down for the for the nights. You know, because now it's the mornings coming up and stuff. And I'm like, does this mean that the squad can move about a little more freely, not have to worry because you've got the mayor on your side? Because now the mayor knows. They are monsters who live. No, he doesn't know about the museum. Officer Mac Mac thinks they are just exhibits in the museum because right. he's seen them now. And the mayor just thinks, OK, they're out there somewhere. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm anxious to and maybe I'm setting myself up for a <laughs> disappointment. But in a future episode, I want to see how the mayor interacts with them next. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And clearly, uh, the the newspaper in this bygone era. Who I'm I'm a former, I'm a survivor of the newspaper industry myself. Uh, but uh, it was very important. So I'm wondering uh, what what newspaper coverage is coming is happening because they they there's newspaper stuff in this one. I think. 
Oh, sure. I mean, you know, explaining, first of all, why the mayor suddenly reverses his decision to do the taxes, assuming giving the money back and all this other stuff, and explaining that it's from Mephisto and, you know, that's what happened there. And if not for what? The Monster Squad or an independent group? Like, you know, and, and for that matter, again, the proclamation. You know, you can't just make a proclamation without somebody knowing it's entered into record. So he's got to explain to somebody who this monster squad that he's, uh, you know, extolling the virtues of. Yeah, um, Mr. Mayor. Okay, I've got this proclamation, but who is this monster? Oh, what we didn't. Nobody were there. Pictures. Who is the, who are these people? Right. And he's like, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> just, just write it down on that parchment. Yeah. <laughs> and, and quiet down. I'm the mayor. You know, maybe maybe it was one of these things where they're like, well, it's not that crazy because at least he's giving the money back. Yeah. <laughs> in in bags. Yeah, in bags. <laughs> Going around and just dropping off bags of money because that's what we do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, overall, though, I, I got to say I enjoyed this one more than the last one. I, um, Alice Ghostly really set the bar. True. In episode one, but this one, the, the guy, the Mephisto's costume is impeccable. Yes. Black and the red. I mean, the mm, solid and the dolls are all in. They would have been easily at home in a Batman episode. Yes. And they just clearly, uh, uh, you know, they probably, they, they have to film these very quickly. It's yeah. Batteries. They didn't have a lot of time, but I don't know what cracked me up more in the big fight scene. But at the end when uh, they were struggling to put the pillowcases on the dolls and it, <laughs> the dolls were not cooperating. Right. It was not working out and they just cut away. <laughs> <laughs> And the next time we see it, they've got the pillowcases over their heads. Yes, they're like, look, we, we, we can't shoot, we can't shoot this anymore. Just, just do it. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely, definitely. You know, a, a Batman sixty six feel to this. But the, the, and you know, what's funny, I because I, I went and you know, I'm looking at the the list of episodes and such on Wikipedia. This show was developed by Stanley Ralph Ross, who you know, wrote many of the more popular episodes of the Batman 66 series. And while he developed this show, and I'm sure he has his fingerprints all over it in terms of being, you know, some sort of story editor, what have you, he only wrote one episode of the series and that's not till nearly the very end. Oh, I, I, I think I just assumed he wrote all of them. I, I assumed the same thing too, because there are certain episodes I know he managed to get certain jokes that he couldn't get in Batman 66 into the episodes. But in terms of actual credit for writing an entire episode, he has one. Now we also will see him appear in one episode. Uh, I don't know if he's a henchman. He's not the villain, but um, he's he's in the episode. Oh, good. Well, um, yeah, this is tour de force. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, folks, that's going to do it for this episode of the Batcave Podcast. Before we go, though, Joe Crow, by the time this gets out, the Virtual Dragon Con episode or, or convention will pretty much be over, and we may get it out during that time. But, you know, how did this all come about in, in terms of getting – give us a quick, like, idea for those who may have missed it because, you know, there's those folks who do virtual conventions and then there's Dragon Con with all the multi-tracks. So how did you guys, like, get this all up and running in terms of trying to give everybody that experience and especially considering now you anybody could just walk in and be at Dragon Con this year? I am – glad that we are doing this and it is a work behind the scenes of dozens of people all the individual track directors are busting it trying to trying to get a relatively full schedule to happen and it's it's working out but it is an undertaking is what it is Luckily, you know, you, in, in my case, uh, me and my co-director, Gary Mitchell, we're just sort of uh, plugging away at it. We're 
pre-recording some. We're going to do some live, but it is it's 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 a big thing. It's it's a lo- now okay. The, what they're doing with the virtual thing is they're they are dividing it between different areas. And again, by the time this episode comes out, um, it's possible that it's already done. And I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> and I hope everyone enjoyed it. But it's gonna they're they're doing multiple tracks of programming so you can watch one th- so you can have conflicts like you do in live action at Dragon Con. They what they want is for there to be more than one thing that you want to do because that's how Dragon Con is. And so that's the that's the basis that the, that's the plot line that they're that that we're going with. And so each individual track like mine for instance and then there's the mainstream current TV show tracks like American sci-fi and fantasy media. And then there's the Star Trek, Star Wars track, those guys. They're all going to have a few panels on main programming, and and so will we. And then each individual track on their individual social media pages and YouTubes and such can have their own additional programming. So it's all, there's going to be tons of stuff to watch and participate in uh, throughout the weekend. And I love that Dragon Con is continuing Dragon Con TV, but doing it as a Roku app. So that, oh, yeah, that, that is great. What I am excited about is getting to not have to be at Dragon Con and getting to experience it on the Roku app. Hmm. Because um, when you're there, it is a blur. <laughs> the, the days pass by and all of a sudden it's time to pack up your junk and leave. And and I, I can only imagine, I mean, I, I know from the backstage portion how much of a blur it is, but to get to actually see all the things that these that 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 we are creating on the Dragon Con and, and there's gonna there's also a channel, I think, for previous years things. So there's a lot of classic panels and classic videos. Uh, and productions that people have made that are going to be on the Roku app too. So uh, they really are going all in on making this a gigantic construction. Right, right. Now, as I say, you got the app, so that's on the Roku. Just search Dragon Con there. You'll be able to find it there. But in terms of getting to the content the the like say for american sci-fi classics or say i don't know the lit track you know is there a central hub that people can go to and then find all the feeds or do you have to go to the individual groups on facebook and such my understanding of it at the moment is <laughs> at the moment uh, is that dragoncon.org is going to be the main feeder page and you can go to everybody's individual things. Nice. Because our Facebook page and our YouTube page are sort of, we've got them working kind of uh, in, in our own personal case, we've got them kind of working uh, together. Like we're, you know, doing things on the Facebook page and then posting the videos on, on YouTube. So very nice. Very nice. And so folks uh, make sure, uh, depending on when this, and, and even if, if not, you can still go back and check out a lot of the content heading over to dragoncon.org, checking out the dragon con, uh, app on Roku. Yeah. And one, one cool thing is, uh, the stuff's still going to be there when dragon cons over. Right. And uh, we have been doing, we've been kind of practicing uh, this for a few months. So we have video panels, video versions of our panels that we've taped live for the last couple or three months. So there, we, we've packed our YouTube with uh, tons of content already. And Dragon Con hasn't even started yet. Very nice. Very nice. So. And and we're also going to keep doing it after Dragon Con is over. We kind of got into a routine with doing um, video panels, um, so we're going to keep keep that content uh, happening after after we get done with Dragon Con. So, folks, make sure you're checking it all out. DragonCon dot org. So, Joe, the next time we get together, we're going to deal with a villain called the Tickler. 
on the surface of it, it sounds very innocent. But I can tell you, folks, when the tickler steps out for his first scene, it scared the bejeebus out of me. <laughs> <laughs> it is uh, the, the woo. Mm. Yeah. And the, the sidekicks are terrifying also. In their own way, yes, they are. Yeah. <laughs> Usually the sidekicks are just there to get punched or, you know, thrown around. But these two sidekicks are distressingly disturbing. <laughs> yes. Yes, they are. <laughs> So that's going to be happening on Joe and I's next look at uh, the episode Monster Squad, The Tickler. You can check that out coming up soon here on the feed, as well as our continuing looks at the movie interpretations that people have done on the Batman 66 series, our look at the Batman 66 comic books, our uh, look at Electro Woman and Dinah Girl, um, Joe Crow and I talking, not Joe Crow, sorry, Joe Stuber and I, I got two Joes, Joe Stuber and I uh, talking about the Batman 77 filmation series, and of course Jim Baird and I taking on the 1940 serials, all happening here. At the Bat Cave Podcast, make sure you are signed on either at batcavepodcast.com or through one of your podcasting apps to make sure you get the latest episode. Joe, once again, thanks for doing this and thanks for your patience in getting this all back up and running again. Oh, it's it's the internet. It's it's a crazy time. Everything everything is happening all at once. Space and time have collided. It's it's a it's a mess. It is, uh, and, and, but it's it's a good mess. We're we're navigating through. That's it. That's exactly it. So until then, folks, thank you so much for listening. Once again, Joe. Everyone, take care. Yeah.